Jesus ministering to a, a broken man who had failed him terribly, restoring him, and then teaching him some very simple lessons that would keep him from falling, or at least be a hedge against him falling and failing in the future. The man who had failed Jesus so terribly was the Apostle Peter. Peter was boisterous, he was strong, he was aggressive, he was prone to great revelation, also prone to blunder and mistake. He, he was given to some emotional highs and emotional lows. And what Peter had done, most of you probably know the story, but prior to Christ's arrest and then his subsequent crucifixion, Jesus had told the disciples, he said, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to get arrested and I'm going to be crucified, but I'm going to be raised from the dead and all of you are going to abandon me. And Peter did a couple things. One, he said, no, this isn't going to happen. And two, he said, I'll never abandon you. I'll never forsake you. And if you know the story, Jesus gets arrested. And three successive times, Peter denies Jesus. He has an opportunity to stand for Christ. And three successive times, he denies him. In fact, in one of the denials, he goes so far as to say, I, I, I don't even know the man. So we're going to be talking about that today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you and I praise you for your word. I thank you and praise you, Lord, that you have chosen to meet with us today. Thank you that this day was carved out on your schedule from eternity past, such that it is. And Lord, that you, you've intended to, to speak to your people by your spirit through your word today. And Lord, we don't take that lightly. We, we're, we're sorry that we don't have the same sense of anticipation and expectation of meeting with you that you have with meeting with us. And I pray that you would change that in our hearts, Lord. So especially as we gather together for corporate worship and gather together to hear your word, Lord, that you would begin to develop more and more in us a real anticipation and expectation that we're going to actually meet with you through your word and through worship and all of that. So Lord, I'm, I'm counting on that this morning, I'm counting on your Holy Spirit to illuminate your word and accomplish your desire in Jesus' name. Amen. Some years ago, when I was quite young, I was preaching. I was preaching on a Sunday night. And as I I'd prepared, I'd prayed hard. But as I was preaching, I felt like I was standing outside of myself. And standing outside of myself, I was listening to myself. And I said, this is really bad. This is, this is really, this is really terrible. I just wasn't preaching well. It wasn't going well. I wasn't making, I, I was just doing a bad job. And so what I did is I stopped preaching. I apologized to the congregation for just preaching about something I just didn't have the knowledge or experience base for, and then I mercifully closed service. I was so embarrassed. I never wanted to see any of those people again. I didn't want to preach again. And this was young, and I was young, and I felt a call into the ministry, and this is what you do. But after that night, when I was done with that night, I said, you know what? I want to do anything but this. Anything else you have for me, I'll do. I don't want to do this. Uh, just it was, it was a, man, a colossal failure. Have you ever failed? I mean, have you ever failed like big time? I mean, you might have failed a test or an assignment at school. Maybe you, you, you failed a work assignment, but maybe you failed at something bigger. Maybe you failed at romance. Maybe you failed at marriage. Maybe you failed somehow at parenting. Maybe you made a really, really bad decision financially. Failed there. There's a whole array, a whole arena of failures. But I mean, have, have you ever failed? Uh, have you ever failed and thought, you know what, I don't even want to try that again? Yes. I, I give up. Well, I'll gu guess what? That was Peter. That was the Apostle Peter. He, we're we're going to see Peter. In fact, let's just do it. Uh, let me get my Bible here. John chapter 21. That's Peter. It starts out in J chapter 21, verse 1. It says, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. In other words, he showed himself as a resurrected Christ again. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of the disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Peter said, I'm going fishing. There's nothing wrong with fishing. Peter had been a commercial fisherman. He said, I'm going fishing. Maybe he was going fishing for therapeutic reasons. Maybe he was going fishing to earn some money. But he said, I'm going fishing. And if you know something about Peter, you'll know that when Jesus called him, he was a fisherman, and he called him out of fishing, and he said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Peter said, I'm going fishing. You know what Peter's, you know what's going on here in Peter's heart and life? It seems very apparent to me. It's this. It goes something like this. He said, you know, I tried that apostle thing. 
I tried that following Jesus thing. I tried that bearing witness of Jesus thing. I tried to do that kingdom of God thing and I didn't do it very well. I failed. I fell woefully short. I'm going fishing. You know why I'm going fishing? Because fishing is something I can do. Fishing is something that I do well. What I think was going on with Peter is he was just backsliding a little bit. He had met the resurrected Christ and that was great and Jesus was raised but he didn't see his part in it. He didn't see how he fit. And the scripture, he says, I'm, I'm going to go fishing. And then the rest of the disciples that are with him, they said, we're going to go with you. We're going fishing too. Yeah, I don't know. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know what happens sometimes? Somebody backslides and a whole group of friends backslide along with them. Somebody says, you know what? I'm just getting tired of this. I'm getting, t you know, it's just such a struggle to follow Jesus. I'm going out to the club tonight. And then three of the close Christian accountability partners say, you know what? I'm going to. Peter says, I don't do this thing too well, so I'm going to go fishing. And the rest of them decide to go fishing with them. So, so they all go out fishing. And it says they went out, they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. It, it, this is a repeated theme in the scripture. I mean, these guys were successful businessmen. They had to be. But every time you read about them, they catch nothing. I mean, they're always helpless until Jesus comes on the scene. And this is no exception because what, what Jesus does with him is he restores Peter. He also teaches them some, some things. And what Peter's going to really, really have driven home to him here is that apart from, uh, Jesus said, apart from me you can do nothing. Apart from Christ you can do nothing. What Peter's going to learn is humility. He's going to learn the absolute need for dependence upon Christ. And it says, just as the day was breaking, verse 4, Jesus stood on the shore. Now, we don't know how long Jesus stood on the shore, but we know that he was on the shore long enough to start a charcoal fire, to have to grill or broil, whatever you do, with fish and bread and have a breakfast prepared. The scripture says, as the day was breaking, these guys had been out all night, Jesus stood on the shore. Don't know how long he was there, but it seems like he was there for a while. And as the text goes on, so the, the disciples, yet the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. How many times, I mean think about it, how many times in your life are you just going about life and you don't even recognize and you don't even see Jesus? All right, he's close, he's right there, you don't even see him, you don't even recognize him, you're about doing your own thing, you're about taking care of your own business, you're trying to do what you think you know to do and you know to do well, and you don't even see him. Well, they didn't see Jesus. Now, it's possible that he prevented them from seeing him, not sure at all. But then Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And Children is actually a good translation of the Greek word there. Some of the translation you'll say it says friends. They're just trying to put it in a common vernacular here. But it's interesting. You know, Jesus on the beach here, he reaches, uh, he calls out to him, and that must have been a scene there too. These guys fish all night. They got no fish. It, it seems to me that maybe it was apparent they had no fish. The boat wasn't weighed down. Uh, and he says, children, do you have any fish? I, I don't know what they were thinking. Who is this guy? <laughs> and they answered him, No. And he said to them, cast the net. Well, here too, let me just tell you this. You know what? Peter's there, he's fishing. In his mind and in his heart, this is something he does well. When you are outside of the will of God, even things that you do well will end in disappointment and end in lack. He knew how to fish, but apart from Christ, apart from the will of God, apart from Christ's authorization, there was nothing but disappointment. Then he says, Jesus says to him, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. I don't even know why these guys, do you see they did it. I don't even know why they did it. I mean, you ever think about that? I don't even know why they, they did it. Maybe there was just desperation. I'm not, I'm not sure. I will say this. This is another aside here. Uh, Pastor Jonathan sort of alluded to it a little bit this morning. But you'll see there is one, uh, there's, there's very few formulas in the New Testament contrary to what people may say. But one of the things that's sort of formulaic in the New Testament is this. Uh, Jesus will speak a word. Disciples or someone else will hear it. It seems like faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It will engender faith. And the reason you know there's faith is because they obey it. And then when they obey it, there's either a miracle or some dramatic result. So Jesus says, throw the nets on the other side. And they go ahead and do it. And the scripture says that uh, if, if they cast the net out, it says, so they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the, of the quantity of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work. He threw himself into the sea. 
The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about 100 yards off. So Peter throws himself off. He's going to go see Jesus. Here's the very first lesson. If you're taking any kind of notes, the very first thing you want to see here, the very first thing that we can draw from this that we need to learn and we need to engender and we need to cultivate, and Peter was going to need it, otherwise he was just going to repeatedly fail. And I'll caution right here. Look, this Christian life, the Bible says we, the righteous man falls seven times, rises each time. We're going to have failures. That's just it. What it is, if you can get this this morning, the lessons that Jesus taught Peter will be a hedge against future failures and will be a hedge against quite as severe failures. In other words, they'll help keep you from failing. The very first lesson that Peter needed to learn, needed to have reiterated to him, was what I'll call as the lesson of humility. Uh, he had to know, and it had to be in his heart, in his life, that apart from Christ, he could do nothing. Please know this, apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. It is conventional and somewhat appropriate, that's in John 15, to take that, well, you know, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing that's fruitful or profitable. That is what's being said there, but the truth is even deeper than that. Apart from Jesus, you don't get your next breath. I mean, you just don't. This is a sovereign of the universe that, that decides everything. You don't get your next breath. And even something that you're good at, if he permits you to do it, you get no productivity out there. You get no deep, heartfelt, real satisfaction. Other than he gives that to you. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. The entire Bible is laced with references and exhortations to humility. Bible said, James said, uh, God gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. Peter said the same thing. The psalmist said the same thing. James also said, humble yourself before God, and he will exalt you at the proper time. The first, uh, first Peter, P Peter says this, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you at the proper time. Second Samuel, I think it's 26, it might be 28, not sure. The Bible says that he, God, rescues the humble. He rescues the humble. But then it says this. I'll paraphrase it, but it's true to the, the text. But he is on the lookout for the proud to bring them down. How about that? He rescues the humble. I mean, we know this scripture. It occurred to me this morning. I think we do. At least we've heard it. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking those whose hearts are just, uh, you know, entirely his, that they, he may support them or strengthen them or keep them. But few of us know that he's on the lookout for pride, proud people in order to bring them down. Wow. Pretty strong. So we have this exhortation to humility, this priority that God places upon humility in the scripture. And humility is, a, uh, is expressed in a self-conscious dependence upon God. A self-conscious dependence of, uh, upon God. With a ready awareness or a constant awareness that you can do nothing apart from Christ. And that self-conscious dependence upon God is reflected in comprehensive obedience. It means you obey him. You obey him in the face of whatever human wisdom is, what other, uh, other kind of stuff is coming your way. You obey him. It's you, humility. Now we have a problem, of course, as human beings, and the problem is this, is we're proud. C.S. Lewis was asked, how, how do you acquire humility? And he said, in essence, he said this. Well, the first step in acquiring humility is to admit that you're proud. If you're, if, if you're human today, if you're part of the human race today, and I assume you all are, we, we, all, struggle with, we, all, we all struggle with pride. And prideful people think they know better. Prideful people are often very critical of others because they can't see their own flaws, but they're critical of others. They're also harsh sometimes in that criticism. They're harsh when it comes to other sins, harsh when it comes to other deficits. They, they tend to be attention-seeking. Um, they're not teachable. They don't respond well to authority. They don't understand other people's positions. You start looking at some of those symptoms and some of those signs. If you start to see yourself slotted in there, you're saying, wow, you know, maybe I really do battle for, with pride. And if you don't see yourself in any of those, you most certainly battle with pride. So, so it's part of it. But how, how then, okay, if humility is such, um, you know, such a high priority with the Lord, then how do we go about cultivating humility? 
I mean, how do people that, but their natural bent is not to be humble. How do we go about cultivating humility? Well, I'll tell you the very first thing. I mean, Lewis said, hey, just admit that you're proud. Yeah, I get that. We need to admit it. We need to, we need to repent of it. But I will tell you that the, the first step to getting humble and remaining humble is to have a proper understanding of the cross. Some of this is a little bit inferred in the text here because Peter is meeting with the resurrected Christ. Jesus had died on the cross, been buried, and been raised from the dead. But I'll tell you, there needs to be a proper understanding of the cross. Let me, let me be real clear here. It is absolutely true that, contrary to what some would say, that every single human being has been made in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, we bear this intrinsic value because we are image bearers. But Jesus, look, the message of the cross is not that Jesus died for you because you're so valuable. It's not. The message of the cross isn't, wow, I looked out there, I saw Dave, or I saw Jonathan, or I saw George, or I saw Carol, and I, wow, they're so precious and so valuable. My heart is moved to, to die for them. I'll tell you, you got to, Jesus didn't die. Ready? All right? Some of you get offended, but listen to the rest of it and you won't. Jesus did not die on the cross to pump up your self-esteem. He didn't die on the cross to pump up your self-esteem. Because the Bible says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were walking in accord with the prince and power of the air. We were enemies of God. We were rebels. We wanted nothing to do with Jesus. See, the cross is not about you. It's about God's greatness. It's not about how great and valuable you are. It's about how great and valuable God is. It's about God who's decided to redeem you and set you free from your sins. It's about his righteousness. The Bible says, uh, essentially, I mean, if you read Romans 3, 21 through 26, it says the, the central message of the cross was, was Jesus himself or God himself vindicating his own righteousness. So, yeah, we're saved by grace and we're, uh, uh, the blood of Jesus has cleansed us of all sin and we rejoice in all that. But the cross isn't fundamentally, about, it isn't at all about your self-esteem. It's about how great God is. And what you come out with on the other side of the cross really isn't so much self-esteem either, but it's Christ's esteem because now I'm a new creature in Christ. Now I have a new power in me. Now I have a new potential in me. Now I have a new identity. Now I belong to a new family. I have a whole new future. I have new gifting or I have redeemed gifting. Everything change. But you know what? It's all in Christ. So my new identity and who I am is rooted in Christ. So how is it that you're going to acquire humility? Have a right understanding of the cross and always remember it and never forget it. And let, let cross let cross-centered living be your priority. If you do that, what you're always going to see is how great God is and how great you're not. Here's the other thing. Want to cultivate humility? Read the Bible. Read about God. When you read about God and you read what the scripture says about God, God is going to be enlarged in your eyes. He's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And as a consequence, you're going to get smaller and smaller and smaller by comparison. Here's another one. I, I found, I know some of you might, you're, you're, not, you're not the same as Macy as it might say, I don't know about that. Look, I love to read. You could do an audio book if you want. But read some books that actually have some theological content to it. See, there's nothing bad with theology. Theology is just a study of God. If you love someone, you study them. You want to grow. You want to know more about them and more about them. Well, I, from a very young age, I loved theology. And I always, you know, I had so many people, oh, this is dry, this is it, you know, this is head knowledge and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, man, I'm so sick of hearing this. And then five, there's a couple things that happened to me. One when I, when I would study about God, like when I found out, when I studied about God, and I found out God is omniscient. And then I realized what that was. God knows, God knows everything. He knows past and present and future. And God even knows what's called contingent knowledge. You say, contingent knowledge? Yeah, read in Matthew chapter 11. He, he said to some of his contemporary cities, he said, you know, if Sodom had seen what you've seen, if Sodom had seen what you heard, if Tyre and Sidon had seen and heard what you did, they would have repented. In other words, if this had happened back then, I know what would have happened. Because there's nothing, all knowledge is available to me. And all time is equally present to me. I, God is omnipresent. That's another one. No way I can go to get away from God. There is no hiding from God. Now, if I go to a bad place, if I go to a good place, if I go to a neutral place, wherever I go, there is no getting away from God. 
And you know what? Sometimes, you know, this is, I could put this together with you in the Bible, but even when we talk about hell, now hell, you know, eternal separation from God, a better way, if you slice it the way the scripture slices it, it's actually eternal separation from the loving presence of God. Because God doesn't suddenly not become omnipresent because there's people being punished in hell. What the Bible, what the Bible teaches fundamentally is we all deserve the wrath of God. Hell is eternal separation from the loving presence of God is what it is. And there aren't there, 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 there are no condemned sinners in hell that are suddenly coming to love God. That's a misconception too. If anything, they hate God all, all, all the more. But when I began to read, and I, I began to read, God's omnipotent. That means He's all. That means He's all powerful. That means God is able, and that doesn't mean, see, God, God has kind of, uh, well, theologians call it self-limiting God. He's limited himself according to his word and his character. So God can do everything and anything that's consistent with his will and his character and his word. But he, he cannot, because he's hemmed himself in, do things that are inconsistent with his character, his will, and his word. And contrary to what some knuckleheads say, he doesn't, he doesn't engage in what will be called logical absurdity. What's a logical absurdity? Can, he make a, can God make a rock that he can't lift? Well, that's just stupid. He doesn't, he, he, he doesn't. I mean, read the Bible. You can do a superficial reading of the Bible and you'll see that God doesn't engage in the word I'm using, or words I'm using here is logical absurdities. He just simply doesn't. Well, you begin to read about things like, oh, this is amazing. And then you begin to read about what the theologians call communicable attributes. That means some things that we share in, but we really don't. I mean, when it gets down to it, they talk about God being wise, the wisdom of God. Well, we have wisdom too. But guess what? As soon as you put an adjective in front of that, God is infinitely wise. God is infinitely holy. Right? God is infinitely loving. God is infinitely merciful. You can't even quantify that. That means that's beyond quantifying. It's be and here's what happens. You want to get, you want to, you want to, you want to embrace humility? Start seeing how big and how great God is. Give yourself just a little shot. Uh, study God and who is God and the nature of God. And if you don't feel smaller, that doesn't mean you feel bad, but you could if you need to be convicted. But you feel smaller, then you haven't studied God properly. And what that does, it doesn't diminish you. What it does is it enlarges God in your own eyes. You can't make him any bigger than he is, but it'll get enlarged in your eyes and you will be ever the more ready to put your faith in him and trust in him no matter what. So the first thing he's teaching him is humility here. And then Peter jumps out and here he is. He's going to make his way to shore because it's the Lord. In verse 9 it says, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter, here's Simon Peter, right? He already jumped out and he got there. Now the other guys are bringing everything up. And now the Lord, hey, bring some of the fish that, that you just caught. So there's Simon Peter. He's jumping right to it. This is Simon, big, strong fisherman. He's just pulling the whole thing. The Bible says here, uh, Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore. <laughs> Full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Let me just point something out here, first of all. That while Jesus said, come and bring the fish up here, recognize he already had breakfast prepared. Now, we don't know. The text doesn't tell us. But there is absolutely no indication in this little narrative section here that Jesus used any of their fish. He asked them to bring it and bring them up here. But you know what it looks like to me? It looks like he said, bring them up here and deposit them on the beach. In other words, bring them up here and lay them right down here. Bring up what you've just produced, with my help of course. Bring what you've just produced. Bring the fruit of your labor. Bring the fruit of your gifting. And here's what I want you to do with it. I want you to plop it right here on the beach and then you can come and you can have breakfast with me. Jesus said, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread, gave it to them, and so were the fish. This was the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So he, he, they, they bring their stuff, and Peter brings his stuff, and now he's going to have a conversation with the Lord. The second thing that seems very, very apparent to me, something we need to learn, and something Peter had to get adjusted to in his life, and it was this. He, he needed to learn the lesson of, of patience, is what it was. He's, you bring, well, here it is. Yeah, it jumps in. He's coming here. I'm going to get to Jesus. Bring the, bring the fish up. He's jumping out there and he's pulling the whole thing in. And then Jesus says, you know what, all the stuff that you do, leave it right there and come and sit with me. What he's saying is something like this. He says the same thing to you. Listen, Peter, in my time I'll use you and in my way I will use you. Right now, 
You need to sit here at my feet. Right now, we have to have a conversation. And you see, really, Peter's not that much different than us. We, by nature, tend to be. Anybody here an impatient person? All right, the rest of you, man, I knew this church was great because almost everybody, I mean, overwhelmingly is patient. It's just, it's astounding. I guess all the good preaching over all the years. You know, we just, whoa, look at that. This is the fruit of it. The fact of the matter is, whatever you might feel like acknowledging here, the, the tendency of us is to be impatient. That's why the Bible addresses it so often. Uh, there's two primary Greek words that are used for patient or translated patience in the New Testament. One of them is hupomeno, which means really patience with people. And another is makrothumeo, which is patience with circumstances, patience with life. One patience with people, other patience with life. In James, James kind of enlarges on this a little bit. James chapter 5, 7 through 11 and you can turn there if you like, but you don't need to, because I've already turned to it a lot of times, <laughs> is first, he talks about patience. And first thing he says is you need to be patient. I'll put it in our language. You need to be patient with your circumstances. You need to be patient with whatever God is doing in your life. You need to be patient with where you're at. doesn't mean a passive patience. It's not a, you know, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. I was talking to someone the other day, someone I was trying to help, um, with a really difficult situation in their life. And she said to me repeatedly, well, whatever will be, will be. I said, that isn't how you serve Jesus. See, this isn't a, a passive patience. This is something that's looking to Christ. This is something that's looking to embrace the will of God. This is something, if the thing is bad, and I think God wants me out of it, then I need to pray to get out of it. But it's patience with whatever your lot is in life at this particular time. I mean, Paul even says it at another point. You know, whatever situation you were in when you got saved, don't be looking to move from it. The only exception he makes to that, he says, if you happen to be a slave, you can pray to get free. But if you don't get free, make sure you can just be patient where you're at. And then the second thing he says, essentially, is he says you need to be patient with people. Now, being patient with people, see, that, that's, uh, that goes sort of like this. That's my patience with you and your patience with me and my patience with me. I mean, we need to bear with one another. That's just simply what the, the scripture says. And we tend to be impatient. We tend to be impatient with our children. We tend to be impatient with our Christian leaders. And we tend to be impatient with our congregations. We say you need to be patient with people. And then James, and you kind of draw it as an inference, the third thing he says there is you, you need to be patient with God. See, if we tend to be an impatient... See, you're in a hurry and God's not. We want things now. And that isn't the way God works. It, it, God always comes through. He really does. I mean, you know, the oath, you know he, he's never late, but he's rarely early. That, that's a truism. I've been a Christian for 50 plus years now. Guess what? Uh, it, it's never like, you know, he arrives early. It just, oh, Jesus is here early to pick you up. No. It's like, I got to be there. I need this now. And he's like one minute before midnight. Why? I'm not sure. I can deduce some reasons why might be the case there, but it's, it's, it's simply not really clear to me. But anyhow, the second thing Peter needs to learn here, and we all need to learn, is this notion of patience. Colossians 3 tells us we're to put on patience, and then it follows immediately. Put on patience, bear with one another. Put on patience, bear with one another. And then a few verses after that, it says, let the word of God richly dwell in your heart. I'd take away from that then, the way that we put on patience, two, two ways that you can put on patience is this. One, live life together with other people. You got to be in, you know, bear with, that's the only way. You're going you're gonna to bear with other people, you're going to put up with other people, and you're going to walk life out together with them. And guess what? One way or another, <laughs> you're going to learn patience, or you're going to pack it in, in, in which case... You failed, like Peter did. The, the second thing is just this whole idea of letting the Word of God richly dwell in your heart. I, I always feel like I'm coming back to the basics constantly, but the older I get, the more that I see the basics are so valuable. It's spending time in the Word of God. When you spend time in the Word of God, and you get to know God, and you pray, and He, he, he opens up the Scripture to you, and you understand, and you see how God works, and you see what God has done. What that does is give you extreme confidence in the way God works things out, in the timing of God. So when I read this scripture and I begin to see God who's always faithful and always comes through, 
even if he doesn't come through on the timetable that people wanted, he always comes through and it's according to his time and he redeems it. Then in whatever place I find myself, I have a much better chance, again, of putting on that patience. And then the text goes on. It says, when they had finished breakfast, verse 15, Jesus said to Simon Peter, and I'm not going to do, you that have been Christians, I'm not doing a thing that you've heard a whole bunch of times about love, love, love. Okay? So you're like anticipating that, or you were sitting there saying, I know what he's going to say. No, you don't. Because I'm not going to say what you thought I was going to say. It says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And you know what's going on here, right? Peter denied Jesus three times right next to a charcoal fire. Jesus got a charcoal fire going here, feeding Peter. And taking them by three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Let's unravel that denial. Let's restore you. So he said to him the third time, son of John, do you love me? You know, I like that too, right? He, he, he doesn't call him Peter. He calls him Simon, son of John. What was that? That was his human name. You know why? Because Peter was in the flesh and had been in the flesh. And <laughs> Jesus is about to get him out of the flesh. So he's using his human name there. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So here's the last thing he's teaching me. He's telling him, well, first of all, he's prophesying to him. He said, you know what, Peter, you're going to have another chance to stand for me. You, you had three chances before I died. Now you're going to have a chance after, and you know what? You're going to stand for me, and you know what? You're going to die for me, and you're going to glorify me in, in that death. You're going to glorify me in that stand. Here's the third thing he's telling Peter, and Peter needed to hear this. I, th I really think he did. Um, and all the disciples really needed to hear this, and we need to hear this. You know what? It will cost you to follow Jesus. It simply will. In Peter's case, it cost him his life. There was a little boy by the name of Peter, eight years old in the Philippines, 1992, and he was kidnapped by the National People's Army, the NPA, which was the military arm of the Communist Party in the Philippines. Peter was there with his mom and dad and also his uncle, who was a missionary evangelist. His uncle used to go up into the mountains, used to evangelize the people there. Sometimes he'd take Peter along with him and he would help in the children's ministry. During that ministry, over the weeks and months, and I don't know if it was years, but some MPA members, terrorist organization members, got saved. And they, they left the organization. They abandoned it. And that upset some of the leaders in the MPA. So what they did is they kidnapped this little boy, Peter. And then they sent a note and said, if you, this missionary, if you will surrender yourself to us, we're going to return this boy to his parents. And I actually think the missionary is perfectly willing to do that. But the boy's parents said, no, we're not doing that. We're not going to interrupt this and we're not going to stop preaching the gospel. They also, kind of the backstory to it, they were pretty certain, I think, in their own mind, in their own heart, that it was already too late. I mean, these are terrorists. They're, they're not giving him back. He's, he's done. They said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to, we're not going to give in to that. And they, they essentially sacrificed their child. I can't even imagine this, man. Can you imagine an eight-year-old? Eight I'm going to think. I mean, little Joel... Who, does, who can do that? Man, I'll tell you, if you don't prize something much, much bigger, and much, much more precious, you can't do that. There's no way. Anyhow, a April 17th, 1992, it was a good Friday, and Peter was murdered. And he, it turns out he was tortured for several uh, hours prior to his death. His hands were wired shut. There were wounds from an axe on his legs and his head, and then he was, and then he was beheaded. It'll cost you to follow Jesus. It, it really will. Um... Not too many years ago in Indonesia, where there were some radicalized Muslim terrorists, Islamic terrorists, uh, who were just mercilessly persecuting Christians. There were four teenage girls, Christian girls, and they were ambushed by six cowardly terrorists with machetes. And they were attacked. And one of the girls, Noviana, she was 14 years old, she somehow escaped with machete wounds to her face. The other girls weren't, weren't so fortunate. There was Teresa who was 14. There was Ida who was 15. And there's Alfinia or Alfinia who was 15. All of them were murdered 
and beheaded. Two of the heads were put near the police station in town, and one of the heads was put right in the front of the local Pentecostal church. It will cost you. It will cost you to follow Jesus. Now, here's the truth, okay? Everybody in this room, I don't know for sure, but probably you're never going to come down to a life or death thing with deny Jesus or die. Probably not going to happen to you. But it could, so don't just shelve it off to the side. It could... And if it did, choose Jesus because he's the pearl of great price. He's the, he's the infinitely valuable one. He's the one that's able to do anything and everything and provide for you and meet you and give you eternal life. But it's unlikely that that's ever going to happen to you. But there's a cost in following Jesus. And there's some, there's some challenges you're going to be faced with in life. It may be to follow Jesus is going to create some embarrassment for you. It might be to follow Jesus is going to create some alienation for you. It might be to follow Jesus is going to engender some ridicule for for you. Uh, a week or so ago, I, it was before the second playoff game with the 76ers, and this game was coming on at 8 o'clock, and I told my wife and I told my son, because I was going to watch it with him, I said, look, I'm going to hit the gym real quick. I'm going to hit the gym and then come back and watch the Sixers game with you. So I went to the gym, and I'm at the gym, I'm working out, I'm having a good workout, and it was this, uh, their family and friends, they're, uh, they're actually like a little group of power lifters. There's the guy and then his son, 16-year-old son, and then I think it's the guy's girlfriend. And they're all really good power lifters. And power lifters, they do bench press, squat, and deadlift. And the guy had ju just a few minutes before that, he deadlift 655. He pulled that up. I think he benched about, he benched about six, uh, 440. Uh, really strong. And the young guy, 16-year-old, really strong. And the female, I've watched her through the years. She's, she's can't be more than 22. I guess she could be, but she does, sure doesn't look like it. She's really strong too. So, you know, I don't really know them. I mean, I, I always try to talk to people, but I, I never really had, they're kind of into their own thing, so I'm bothering, but I'm working out, and they're, they're right in front of me, because where I was working out, they were right there, and this girl, this young lady, she's 20, 22, 23, she's getting ready to pull a deadlift, and she's, she's about to deadlift 405. Now, any of you that don't know what that is, for, for a female, that's a lot of weight. That's more than like 90% of the guys in the gym, and she's going to do it, I'm positive, because I've seen her pull some heavy weights before. Anyhow, she starts pulling the weight, and she gets part way up, and then she, she collapses and starts crying, and she grabs the back of her leg. I knew right away, because I've seen people have this before. It was her hamstring. But, I mean, she started crying, and then she started crying hard. I knew she was hurt. And the guy, I think he's her boyfriend, is coming up and talking to her. And I'm, I'm standing there, and I'm like... I mean, there's all these things going through my mind. I said a prayer for her real quick. And then I thought, you know, if I were a doctor, if I were a nurse, if I were an EMT, I would just step right into that. And I, I would see if I could help in some way. And then I thought, well, you know what? I'm a Christian. I'm connected with the most powerful being in the universe. Yeah. So I thought, you know, I'm going to just go over. I don't know. So I went over. I said to the guy, I said, listen, I said, I'm a Christian. You mind if I pray? Pray for her. He was, he's not a Christian. I know he's not a Christian. He said, no, it's okay. Go ahead. So I, I knelt down. I laid hands on her. I prayed for her. He even bowed his head because I watched. He bowed his head and, and I prayed for her and I prayed that God would heal her. I prayed God would restore her. I prayed God would give her peace. But you know what? I, I went through thoughts that I shouldn't have to go through because when I was standing there, I'm thinking, this is going to look really stupid. I'm going to walk over here. I'm going to kneel down in the gym and I'm going to pray for her. This is going to look really dumb. I wonder what people will think. But then also, here's what I've been finding. This is another thing. This is just a natural thing. The older you get, the less you care what people think. And then on a, more, on a more spiritual side, when it gets right down to it, what's most important is what God thinks. So, look, this is going to be cost in following Jesus. There just is. Probably not going to cost you. You're probably not going to die for it, but you could, depending on where God takes you. But there's going to be a lot of things every day, every week, every month, where you're going to face with choices where it's, it's going to cost you some way to align yourself with Jesus. So, just simply know that. Embrace, cultivate, humility, because we are proud people by nature. I, 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 if I were going to blow something up with you, I could talk to you about even the people that seemingly have the worst self-esteem, actually have this, string, uh, this stream of pride that's running through them that is actually expressed in their low self-esteem confessions. Look, we just simply have it. Understand the cross properly. Meditate on the word of God. Let God be enlarged in your eyes and your heart. As uh, John the Baptist said, he must increase, I must decrease. As he's increased in your eyes, there'll be a natural and appropriate humility that grips you. Patience, in, in my view, I, I think is best found 
by one, doing life together with other people. That means doing life together with people more than a week, more than two weeks, more than a month. Boy, you know what? We want to be a church and we're sending people out and we're sending people out. But there's people that you're going to do life together with. Even the people you send out, we're well, going to do it for years. You're going to do it for three years. You're going to do it for five years. You're going to do it for 10 years. You're going to do it for 20 years. You're going to do it for 30 years. You're going to do it for 40 years. I'll tell you, you're going to learn patience when you're walking life out with people for that many years. And secondly, you're going to put on patience. You better put on the Word of God because the Word of God's going to let you see God as you ought to see God. And God isn't this microwave God. He isn't this God that, that you ask and you instantly get what you want. But he's a faithful God and you can trust him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you to love us. And I thank you even when we fail, Lord, you don't give up on us. You don't discard us. You don't kind of relegate us to sort of this uh, section or, or people group that you don't use anymore. But rather, Lord, you restore us and you redeploy us in service. And Lord, then even prior to that deployment, so to speak, Lord, you, you equip us fresh and you teach us some things that we need to know that'll keep us from failing in the future, that will serve as a hedge from failing in the future. So, Lord, certainly for us as children of God, we want to, Lord, we want to, we want to kind of digest and internalize those lessons. And, Lord, we want to move forward in a, a certain confidence that we have in you in two ways. One, Lord, as we embrace what you teach us, that we're not going to fail. But, Lord, secondly, in a very vivid awareness that sometimes, you know what? We are going to miss it. We are going to get tripped up. But, God, you won't leave us there. You're going to bring us back. And you're going to restore us. And you're the one that started the work. And you're the one that's going to finish it. And you'll bring us all the way through. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen.